just want to open with the reading of the first three verses in Nehemiah, but we're going to we're going to go through the whole chapter. We're going through Nehemiah verse by verse, chapter by chapter. Today we're obviously in chapter 4. But it so happened when Sanballat, and that's one of the enemies, one of the opposition to Nehemiah, heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he was furious, very indignant, and he mocked the Jews. And he spoke before his brethren and the army of Samaria, what, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? Will they revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish, stones that are burned? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him, and he said, and this is a mock as well, well, whatever they build, even a fox, if it goes up on it, he'll break down their stone wall. So Lord, as we open your word, once again, let it be like that sharp two-edged sword that comes and pierces and not just cuts, but heals and restores and rebuilds all in our lives that you want to see happen. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Scripture tells us to love our neighbors and to love our enemies. G.K. Chesterton, a brilliant British theologian and writer, said the reason Scripture says this is because our neighbors and our enemies are usually the same people. Have you found that out to be true sometimes? The guy across the street, maybe. Nehemiah has some tough neighbors as he comes back in to this area of Jerusalem. He's there to rebuild. He's created some danger, really, some, some insecurity in his neighbors and his enemies as he's reestablishing the authority and the power of the city of Jerusalem. So Sanballat and his friends, his cronies, well, they decide to oppose him. We saw it in chapter 2, verse 10. We, we saw the very first time that Sanballat came up against him. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard of it, that is, Nehemiah coming back, they were disturbed that a man had come to seek the well-being of the children of Israel. They're, they're in power of that region right now. They're of significance. And, and now they see Jerusalem coming back and the Jews lifting up their city. They think, well, th this doesn't need to happen. In chapter 2, verse 19, we saw that Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem, the Arab, heard of it and they laughed at us. They despised us and said, what is this thing that you are doing? Will you rebel against the king? And of course, they weren't rebelling against the king. They had the support of the king. So opposition, it's real. And in our study last week, in chapter 3, we had this strategy of Nehemiah's to get the wall around Jerusalem built. And we saw all the different groups. You heard people come up here and read those names, and they butchered those names. They slaughtered those names. And we, we listened. And we, we saw the different groups, the different areas, the different gates. And then here, now, in chapter 4, the, the sort of the heat is being turned up. And so it happened when Sanballat heard that they were rebuilding the wall, he was furious, indignant, and mocked the Jews. Angry is the word. Actually, very boiling hot and, and irritated. The enemy never wants to see the work of the Lord succeed, take root, and get established. So when the walls are being rebuilt, they come against them. As long as they're, they're, they're destroyed, as long as they're torn down, and there's no activity going on, no rebuilding, hey, the enemy leaves them alone. It's a lot like that in our lives. As long as you just coast and, you know, do nothing for the Lord, kind of 
you know, just put it in neutral. Seems like the enemy leaves you alone. But when God's people begin to rise up, when they begin to stand up for him and serve him and honor his name and represent him rightly, well, the enemy comes. In verse 2, he spoke before his brethren, the army of Samaria, and said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? Will they revive the stones from the heaps of the rubbish, the stones that are burned? Sanballat opens both barrels and calls out five different taunts, ridicules, insults to kind of intimidate and mock the Jews. He says, what are these feeble Jews doing? And that word feeble, is, it's a word that means frail, powerless, weak, or the best word for it really is the term pathetic. What do these pathetic Jews think they're going to do? And words can be pretty powerful. Words can immobilize people at times. I'll never forget a story, true story about my wife and I. We used to play a lot of tennis together. And sometimes we would play doubles and she would be my partner and we'd play another couple. And so we were playing this couple one time and uh, we were in the midst of this match and, and I can be pretty competitive at times. And we were, we were losing. Lynn had muffed a few shots. I had breathed a couple of things under breath. And and I was serving at this time. I really wanted to win my serve. And, and there was this, this one little just, I mean, it was this perfect little lob coming to her. She's on the net. All she had to do was knock it across the court. Point's ours. So she lifts up her racket, and she hits it, and it goes right into the net. And out of my mouth came this word, pathetic. And she looked back in the way only a wife can look back when you say the word pathetic. And so it's time to switch courts. We lost that game, and I'm over on the other side, and I'm, you know, kind of bouncing the ball, waiting for her. And I look, and she's sitting on the bench. The other couple's on that side. And I'm like, and she's putting her racket in the bag, and she's zipping it. And I walked over to her. I go, man, it's not, we're not done. She goes, oh, we're done. I go, are you serious? She goes, yeah. So I had to go over and tell the couple, we, we want to concede at this point. <laughs> and the word pathetic can immobilize a person. It was a while before we played tennis together, but this is the word that's being used. Those pathetic Jews, will they restore and fortify the wall? They're weaklings. He, he attacks the character of the Jews. They're pathetic, they're weak, they're powerless. Then he says, can they restore and fortify the wall? He, he, he actually comes against the job itself. They're not going to do it. Will they offer sacrifices? That, that has to do with when they get finished. Will they, you know, bring a sacrifice of thanksgiving to the Lord? And he's saying, they'll never do that. They'll, they'll never finish the job. He attacks their character. He attacks the job itself. He attacks their future. And, and will they finish in a day because they're working feverishly? And so he attacks their ability. They don't have the ability to do this. There's no way they can complete it. And can they bring these stones back to life and all this rubbish? They don't have the resources to complete it. He just begins to mock. He just begins to attack them from all kinds of different directions. And he uses mocking and ridicule. The, the word ridicule, some have said, is, is the language of the devil. He comes to ridicule. He comes to insult. I mean, you see it all through the Bible. Think of David when he's a young boy and he steps into the valley of Elah, bringing lunch to his brothers. He ends up the only one who's willing to go against that giant Goliath. 
And there he is with his sling and, and maybe his shepherd's staff's laying next to him. And Goliath comes, you know, roaring towards him. David starts crying like a baby. And he's like, and, and Goliath mocks him. He says, you, you, what are you coming to me with sticks and stones like I'm a dog or something? You're going to whip me and throw a stone at me? He says, I'll, I'll feed your flesh to the, to the birds of the air. He just begins to mock him and try to intimidate him. They, they mocked Jesus. They ridiculed him. The soldiers did. They, they literally put a purple robe on him. You know the story. They, they took a... a, a a crown, but they made it out of thorns, and they pushed it in his head, and they slapped him in the face and said, prophesy, hail the king of the Jews. The enemy, listen, will ridicule and mock what God wants to do in your life, and he'll try to get inside your head. Paul was called a madman one time. Paul, you, you, you've been made mad by your much learning, where Paul was just simply telling the gospel Ridicule, the mind games of the enemy. There are many. And he uses that to come against you. And, and so we see this process here beginning to happen with the people of God and as they're beginning to rebuild. And Tobiah, verse 3, and the Ammonite was beside him, and he said, whatever they build, even if a fox goes up on the wall, in other words, it'll be so shabbily done. That a, that a fox who's very light-footed and agile, if he jumps up on it, will knock the wall down. It won't even be worth anything. So, so the mocking comes strong, it comes fast, and, and, and they're working. They're working hard. So, so what does Nehemiah do? What do we do when we sense the, the mocking and the ridicule coming at ourselves? In verse 4, he begins there at the very beginning, and he, and he says this. Hear, O oh our God. Or a better translation might be, God, hear our prayers. What a great example. He, he begins to pray. In chapter 1, he fasted and prayed before he went before the king. In chapter 2, he called on the Lord in the midst of his time when he was in the king's presence. Prayer is a very distinct and consistent part of, of solving this issue, this, this mocking that comes at us. So he says, hear our prayer, O God. It's a great example to go to God first. But then look what he does in verse 4. Hear our prayer, O God, for we're despised. And then he says, turn their reproach on their own heads Give them as plunder to a land of captivity. Let them be taken captive. Let their, their lives be plundered. Don't cover their iniquity. God, don't forgive them. Don't let their sin be blotted out from before you. For they have provoked you to anger before the builders. That's pretty harsh stuff. Don't forgive their sins. Scatter them, Lord. Take them into captivity. And you might be thinking, wow. Can I pray for my friends and enemies that way? Well, you know, they're in a situation where God has sent them. You might be saying, yeah, but John, I've got some people. Telemarketers. People sitting at green lights on their cell phones while I'm trying to get across. People in the checkout line where it says eight items only, and they've got two carts full. I just want to call God's wrath down on them right at that point. Are, are people who attack your faith, attack the truth. This is a time, a different time. The crying out for justice. They're actually crying out that God's will would be done because God had told them to go back and rebuild the walls. We live in a different time. I wanted you to look at Romans chapter 12 where it says, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And then it goes on and says, Therefore, if your enemy is hungry... 
Feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, now I want you to give me your attention for a second. There are times to confront. There are times to correct and rebuke. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, he said, preach the word, tell the truth, but also be ready in season, out of season to convince, but also to rebuke, to exhort, convince with all long suffering and teaching. So we are called at times to tell the truth to people, to use God's word as a sword, to, to cut off and do away with that which is wrong in our hearts and to confront others who are living in a way that's wrong. I love this one pastor, uh, teacher that I know named Damien Kyle, and he was sharing a message one time, and I'll never forget it. He said, I was a new believer, and I was listening to Pastor Chuck's messages. He said, I had them, uh, that this was back in the day of uh, cassette recorders. He said, I'd go to work. He was a lineman for a some place putting in, you know, telephone lines and power lines. He said, I would listen to Chuck all day long. He said, I'll never forget this one sermon where Chuck was dealing with a specific sin in our lives. And he said, it was like Chuck took the sword. He took the word and he, and he, and he, and he focused on that certain issue. And he said, he, it was like he took it and he inserted it into that situation. And he said, it was like, like a scalpel. He said, then while it was there, he said, I thought to myself, okay, Chuck, you, yeah, you got your feet. Twist it, Chuck, twist it. <laughs> and he said, but Chuck didn't do that. He said, he slowly pulled it out like a doctor would with a scalpel, and instead he poured in grace and mercy and healing. And there is a time, right? To say, hey, no, this is wrong, this is sin, and to take God's word and, and insert it, but at the same time, to let them know God heals, he restores, he rebuilds, and he offers healing. San Ballad and his crew, man, they're opposing God's plan. They're, they're against God's call, they're against his work. And so, Nehemiah begins with prayer. But he also continues to work. Verse 6, so we built the wall. The entire wall was joined together up to half its height for the people had a mind to work. They're halfway through the project. The mocking, the, the opposition, they, don't, they, they pray. Listen, they pray, but they continue to build. This is a wonderful principle of God's sovereignty. God, I'm counting on you but I have a responsibility. God, I'm asking you to do your part, but I still got to do my part. I love the story. Maybe you've heard of the, the teacher, the, the pastor, J. Vernon McGee. Great, great Bible commentator. He tells a story one time in his church. He asked someone to do a simple project for him. It was an event coming up, just needed someone to serve. It was a week away. And he asked the individual, hey, would you mind helping out? Could you do this task for us this next week? And he said, the response I got was, well, pastor, let me pray about it. And it says, Vernon said, well, well wait a minute. He said, you know, um, are you just saying this because you don't want to do it? And if you don't want to do it, just say it to my face right now, and I'll find someone else. He said, I don't think you need to pray about this. This isn't a big praying matter. Either you can do it or you can't. Either you will or you won't. And McGee got in his face and said, tell me the truth right now. And he said, he was just putting me off with the pious platitude, oh, I'll pray about it. He said, he had no intention of praying about it or doing it. So I was able to find someone else willing to accomplish the job. What Nehemiah did was pray, but he didn't just pray. He continued to work. 
Sometimes we think, well, I'll pray and I'll wait and I don't want to rush ahead. Let's trust the Lord. Let's see if the enemy backs off. We don't want to get in a hurry. I, I think if you're really praying, you're really trusting the Lord and you're involved in something he's called you to do, don't get stuck in neutral. They're, they're halfway finished. Sometimes the thing is just to do something. They're halfway through the project. Later in chapter 6, verse 15 of Nehemiah, it tells us, so the wall was finished on the 25th day of Ullo. In 52 days, they built this enormous wall. And right now, they're halfway through it. That means that they've been working already for four weeks because the whole thing takes them about eight weeks, and that's with resting on the Sabbath. These guys are working hard, and they're praying hard. Verse 7, it says, Now it happened when Senballat, Tobiah, and the Arabs, and the Ammonite, and the Ashadites heard the walls of Jerusalem were being restored, and the gaps were beginning to be closed. They became very angry, and all of them conspired together to come and attack Jerusalem and create confusion. Nevertheless, we made our prayer to God, verse 9. They pray again. And because of them, we set a watch against them day and night. The enemy's angry. He's upset. He's coming against them. They continue to pray, and now they're praying, and they're watching. And it says in verse 10, then Judah, this is one of the tribes within the people of the Jews. In fact, it's their strong tribe. It's their leadership tribe. They say, well, the strength of the laborers. Well, it's failing. There's so much rubbish that we're not going to be able to build the wall. Now, here we have outside enemies and now inside discouragement. People from within, we can't do it. We're halfway there. There's the ridicule. There's the attacks. Now that their strong team is discouraged, and it says the strength of the labors is failing. And the word there means that they're stumbling, they're tottering, they're giving up. And the reason he gives is, you know, there's just so much rubbish that we're not able to build the wall. There's so much junk. The walls have been there for so long that the people from the city have taken the trash and dumped it on the outside by the walls. The, the bricks themselves have been burned and they're broken in half. The limestone is, is not good to use. And so they've got to clear away the rubbish. If the wall's going to be built properly, if, if the whole thing's going to be accomplished successfully, we've got to move the rubbish out of the way. The old trash has to be removed. And I would submit to you this is a, an interesting principle in the Christian's life. We start off, we come to the Lord, we begin to grow, and, and sometimes we can reach a certain place where it becomes so, so difficult, so hard, and many times the reason is because we won't put aside those things in our life that the Lord put his fingers on, which really is rubbish. It's fleshly. It's things that keep us from moving forward. There comes a time in the Christian's life where he has to say, some of the stuff in my life is rubbish. It's got to go. Fleshly things, things that, that, that are not pleasing in the Lord's sight. I mean, you guys, know, you guys know what fleshly things are? See, two people in here have experienced fleshly things. Well, since you don't know what they are, I'm going to read them to you, so you'll never have an excuse again. Listen up. These are the fleshly things that the Scripture says keep the work of the Lord from being accomplished. In Galatians, the works of the flesh are evident. They're adultery, stepping outside of your marriage, their fornication, having sex with someone who's not your spouse, uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, calling your wife pathetic on the tennis court. That's a work of the flesh. 
envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice, in other words, become a lifestyle, they'll not inherit the kingdom of God. We, we got to move the junk, the rubbish out of the way, Nehemiah says. We, it's got to be gone before we can reestablish and build what God wants to build in this place called Jerusalem. If you want to accomplish his purpose, see, here's the call, here's the task, here's the outline so far. Pray, work, watch, and remove the rubbish. That's part of the deal. He goes on in verse 11, and our adversary said, they will neither know nor see anything till we come into their midst. They're plotting to come against them now in a physical way and kill them and cause the work to cease. Therefore, I positioned men behind the lower parts of the wall at the openings, and I set the people according to their families with their swords that the, and their spears and their bows. Here's what's going on. The men are working, and they're worried about their families and their kids because they're scattered all around. So Nehemiah comes up with this idea of wherever these men are positioned, I'll have their families behind them in the city. So if there is this attack, they will be responsible and know that they can protect their own families, their own children, their own wives, so they're not worried about where they are. And, 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 and they're coming at him now, you know, from, from, from every side. Listen to what it says there in, in, in verse 12. So it was when the Jews who drew near them, they told them us 10 times from whatever place you turn, they will be upon us. They're going to come from all directions. And this is an amazing principle that I want you to listen to. God, God wants you, well, to watch over your families because things start coming at you in all directions. The job, the kids, the politics, the COVID, the bridge, the car, you know, the dog runs off. It's, 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 everything can happen sometimes. And, and as this goes on, he says, I position men behind the lower parts of the wall at the openings. I set people according to their families with their swords and their spears. And I looked in a row and said to the nobles, to the leaders, to the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. And then he gives this great cry. Remember the Lord who's great and awesome and fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. Now, let me have your attention. Look up here for just a second. He says the Lord is with you. He's great and awesome. And your families need you. That's what he says. And I would say to you today, those of you who have families, children, grandchildren, if you're a parent, this is a simple, powerful, profound statement to you and I from the Lord in his word. The Lord is with you and your families need you because we live in a culture where things are coming at us from every single direction in so many ways. They need the truth, they need your love, they need your protection, especially the kids in our culture today where there's all the suicide that's going on, all the lies of the media they're being fed, all this information that's flooding into our schools about gender and transgender and all the stuff that's being funneled their way. Listen, the Lord, your God, is great and awesome. You are responsible to stand up and protect your family. They need you. These men were in a, in a better frame of mind when they knew, hey, I can protect my family and God is with me. In fact, he gives this battle cry, the Lord is great and the Lord is awesome. He's with us. We're, we're armed. Our families need us. They need us physically. They need us spiritually. And the Lord is great and awesome. All battles have like battle cries. Remember the Spanish and American War? You know, remember the... Good. 
the Alamo as well as the, the Maine. They said, remember the Maine. And, and there, there was in, in World War I, perhaps you don't know this cry, remember the Lusitania. There was a ship off the southern coast of Ireland that was, was sunk by a German U-boat. We weren't in World War I at that time. We were kind of hanging back. Europe was being impacted. And when this ship went down off the coast of Ireland, the Lusitania, 1,195 people on board died, and 123 of them were Americans. So our president and our government decided this is where we need to get involved, and we stepped in. And the cry was, remember the Lusitania. World War II, remember Pearl Harbor. And in 2 Timothy chapter 2.8, Paul reminds us of what we're to remember Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. That's our battle cry. Remember the Lord. He's great and awesome. That's what, that's what Nehemiah says. And in verse 15, it happened when our enemies heard that it was known to us, when, when the enemy's tactics were exposed and that God had brought their plot to nothing, that all of us returned to the wall. Everyone to work. The enemy is exposed. Let's get back to work. And then in verse 16, and I'm hurrying along because I told Neil, I'm going to finish faster than you do. <laughs> so it was, verse 16, from that time on that half of my servants worked on construction. The other half, well, they held spears and shields and bows and wore armor, and the leaders were behind all the house of Judah. They're back at work. No surprise. E each builder now is, 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 is being armed. In fact, if you, if you see verse 17, those who built on the walls and those who carried burdens loaded themselves so that one hand they worked at construction, and with the other hand they held a weapon. They got a sword in one hand and a trowel in the other building this, this amazing wall because we're called to build and we're called to fight. We're called to stand against the enemy and be strong. We're, we're not just called to, you know, to, 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 to stand around but to build and fight at the same time. There, there's growth, there's stability, there, there's maturity that's so important in our lives to grow. In Jude chapter 1, there's this verse, I love this verse, but you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. God's given us his sword, and he's given us a task in life to be a part of the building of his kingdom. You know, I, I love to see people come to the Lord, to come into the kingdom, to to, to come to the place where the Lord speaks to their hearts and, and they, they maybe come forward in an altar call or they pray and receive Jesus Christ. But I also love to see people grow up and say, you know what? I want to be part of the mission. I want to have a, 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 a sword in one hand and a trowel in the other, and I want to be a part of what God's doing in my life and in the life of his church and in our community. I mean, we're involved in all kinds of missions, Haiti and, you know, South Africa and Ireland and Mexico, and it's amazing to be involved in those things. But you and I also need to be involved in our own community and growing up and maturing to be on the wall, so to speak. You know, you know new converts are great. Babies are great. But babies are a lot of work, right? I got 13 grandkids almost. I've got, I've got 11 and two on the way. And I've been intersecting with my kids and when their kids are born and you know, go to the hospital, over to their house, and there's the little baby. Oh, the little baby. Yeah, it's so cute. Spit up on you. <laughs> or are we babysat them when they're little and they can't feed themselves? And you try to give them, well, they need, this, they need these vegetables, they need this. You got the little spoon with the rubber tip on it, you know, and you're trying to give them the spinach, and they're like, it's all over the place, and they're spitting it out. 
they're a lot of work. And, and there comes a time where you're praying, Lord, can, I hope they can feed themselves. I hope they can go to the bathroom by themselves. And I love the fact they've come up with these new kind of diapers. They're called pull-ups where kids haven't completely got potty trained. Now, they can pull their own diapers up. <laughs> I'm not going to go any further than that, but it's a great thing. You want kids to get to the place where they can tie their own shoes, where they can get dressed. Where a Christian can say, hey, I know the truth and I understand I'm supposed to have a trial in one hand and a sword in the other and be praying, not just doing nothing. The sword of the Spirit of God and fighting the attacks of the enemy. There's work in the Christian life. In eight, verse 18, every one of the builders had his sword girded at his side as he built, and the one who sounded the trumpet was with me. Now, now listen. I said to the nobles, verse 19, rulers and the rest of the people, the work is great. It's extensive. We're separated from one another on the wall. But whenever you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there. Our God will Fight for us. See, let, let me put it in our day and age. There's work. There's the work of the kingdom to be done, and he's called you and I to do it. There's a lot of work in our culture to have the sword, to have the trowel, to sacrifice. The enemy attacks. Our eyes are on the Lord. But the wonderful thing is also we're waiting for the sound of that trumpet, right? It's going to blow. We're going to all be together. We're involved in the restoring and the rebuilding of lives for his kingdom. In Philippians chapter 1, you have this verse, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. We're involved together in this thing called loving and connecting and being on mission. So we labored, verse 21, in the work of the Lord. And half of the men held the spears from daybreak until the stars appeared. Man, these guys are, they're on call all, from early in the morning till, till the time the stars appear, till dark. They're working all day long. They don't quit. And at the same time, I also said to the people, let each man and his servant stay at night in Jerusalem that they may be our guard by night and a working party by day. It's not over. We're working at night as well. So neither I... Nehemiah is involved. My brethren, my servants, nor the men of the guard who followed me took off our clothes, except to everyone took them off for washing. Now, he closes with this. They work all day. They stay all night. They're unified. They're together. And they, they did, however, and I'll close with this at the very end. He says, we did take off our clothes to take a bath. They're not washing their clothes. They're washing themselves. So I close with this practical note. Personal hygiene is important in mission work. <laughs> Please take a bath. If you're going to work on the wall, if you're going to minister to people, <laughs> smell halfway decent. That's what he closes with. God's word can be pretty practical. It's important in ministry. <laughs> To not offend people like, whew, who's that guy? 